Welcome, Sandals Church. I'm glad you guys are here today. We're going to do something a little different today. I'm joined on stage by my amazing wife of, well, how many years did we decide? 22. We, yeah, it's just Next weird. Month. As you age, sometimes you lose a year. We lost a year. What I really think it was is she was, she was fishing for our 25th anniversary special, so she was trying to make it a little closer. But we decided we were married 22 years, and uh, Anyways, it's been awesome. And my amazing friend, I don't know, we decided for 12 years, 12 years, 12-ish, 13-ish years. Uh, we've been in a small group together, and uh, we've been on staff together, and Christina Crowley is an amazing person. Let's give her a hand today. Super excited. Many of you recognize her from on stage or my wife uh, as the leader of our Cultivate Women's Ministry. But I want to welcome you today. And we're starting this series called The Good Life. And let me just say, some of you are guests and you're joining us uh, here today for the first time. And I just want you to know that God wants you to have a good life. That that's his will for your life. He loves you. He cares about you. And he wants to bless you. That is all throughout the Bible. The challenge is many of us have not experienced a good life. Some of us have had a really, really bad life. And that causes you to question God. And so what I want to just say, first of all, is we're going to be dealing with specifically today the issue of sexual abuse. Now, we're not going to get super into the details, but some of the things will be difficult. So if you have your children present, uh, you know, you need to make that decision right now. But we're, we're, we're not going to get, like, way down into the weeds with it, but we're going to discuss it. So you need to make that decision as a parent uh, right now um, before we get into this. But let me just say this. The number one question I hear when someone goes through anything that's awful, sexual abuse or anything else, it's, why did God allow this? And you just need to understand that God has given us something that is very, very precious. It's called free will. We have the choice to do good or to do evil with our lives. And the reality is many, many people choose evil. And their evil decisions affect us, can actually destroy us, or at least wreck our lives, or at least what we wanted for our life. And so I just want you to understand that, that Love demands choice, free choice. You cannot force love, and so God wants us to love him as he loves us, and so we must choose. So knowing that, that God wants the good life for you, God wants to bless you. Literally, the Bible says, I put for you today blessings and curses. He says, I pray that you choose life. God's rooting for you. He's rooting for you to choose life. But unfortunately, some people have chosen something different for themselves, and they've made this choice in your life. And so today we want to talk about what is God's heart for the abused? Because before we get into this good life series, we want to talk about some of us have had a very, very bad life, a very, very difficult life. And we have two very, very brave women on stage with us today who are going to talk about what's happened to them and how ultimately they have found the good life in spite of the very, very bad things that have been done to them by other individuals who've made choices for them. So my prayer for you today is if you are a victim of sexual abuse or someone you know, someone you love is a victim of sexual abuse, that maybe this is some, something that you can share with them. Um, to say, hey, these ladies found victory, these ladies found hope, these ladies found healing, and you can too to the powerful name of Jesus Christ. So let's just begin with a word of prayer today before we begin our message. And even if you're not a Christian today, would you just honor us as we honor God? We bow our heads just as a physical symbol of the fact that God's God and we're not. So let's bow our head and close our eyes as we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the fact that you are good. Lord, the world is not always good. And Lord, people that we've entrusted ourselves to, that we're supposed to protect us or watch over us, we're not always good, but you are. And so, Father, you are our good Father who loves us, who sent his one and only Son to die for us. I pray that today you would reveal your heart for those of us who've been abused or know someone that's been abused. So, Lord, just anoint my words. God, bless Christina and Tammy with confidence, strength, and wisdom to communicate, Lord, the truths that they've learned in spite of the just incredible, awful things they've had to endure. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So what does God want us to do as a church? The first thing he wants us to do, write this down, is acknowledge the problem. The Bible never sweeps sin under the rug. It never ignores it. It never pretends. It does not exist. Matter of fact, some of you, when you read 
the Bible for the first time, you will be like, oh my God, I can't believe this is in there. Read your Bibles, I'm telling you. Sometimes it's worse than cable. It just is. You, that was funny. You can laugh. It's all right. You know, you need, to, you need to read this. And there are things in the Bible. You're going to say, I can't believe this person did this. Or I can't believe God allowed this to happen. And let me just help you out if you're, if you're learning to read the Bible. Just because the Bible describes an event doesn't mean that God is prescribing it. Sometimes it's descriptive, but it's not prescriptive. So what does it mean, prescriptive? When you go to the doctors, you get a prescription. The doctor says, here, take this, do that. The Bible has those things. They're called laws. Be kind to one another. Love one another. Those are prescriptions. When it describes how idiot people treated each other, that's not a prescription. That's a description of what people do. The laws are the prescriptions for the problems. Here, take this. Do this. Treat people this way. And so we need to understand this. And so today we're going to look at a passage of Scripture that is descriptive. It describes a situation. It actually describes a sexual assault that takes place, but the Bible is not prescribing it. It's simply revealing it. So I want you to remember that as we read. So let me set this story for you. Uh, Tammy and I are big fans on uh, Netflix of The Crown. Anybody watch The Crown? Okay, awesome show. We love it because we love watching how the royals are whack. Right, that makes us feel good. You know, we're not rich or royalty, but we're not that crazy. So we like watching it, um, and it's just a great show that we watch together. So this is royalty. This is the Crown series in the Bible. Okay, this is David. This is his family. These are his kids, and this is what I want you to know. These are some of the most important people in the Bible, and the Bible reveals that they screw it up too. So it doesn't try to hide it, even from the royal family. So David is king. And he has a bunch of kids, and their family is a mess. So one brother falls in love with his sister, and that's not good. So his name is Amnon, and her name is Tamar. And so Amnon has a creepy friend, and he goes to his creepy friend for some advice. And of course, what do you get? What kind of advice do you get when you get advice from a creepy friend? Creepy advice. Some of you need to write that down. And so they plot out how, how Amnon can get alone with his sister. Because culturally, it was very, very difficult to be alone or isolated with your sister at that time. Because you, you, you basically live life in different areas of the palace. So Amnon plays like he's sick. And he requests that his sister bring his favorite dish to him. Because apparently she was a good cook. And so she knew how to make his favorite dish. And she's going to cook this dish and bring it to him to help him in his fake sickness. So she comes over to provide this meal, and Amnon kicks all the servants and all the people out of the house so he can be alone with his sister. And again, this is, this is rough, but this is what happens. It's in your outlines. Then he said to Tamar, now bring the food into my bedroom and feed it to me here. So Tamar took his favorite dish to him, but as she was feeding him, he grabbed her and demanded, come to bed with me, my sister. No, she said. No, she cried, don't be foolish. Don't do this to me. Such wicked things are not done in Israel. She's saying this is wrong. You should not do this. She says, where could I go in my shame? And you would be called one of the greatest fools in Israel. Please just speak to the king about it and he will let you marry me. But Amnon wouldn't listen to her. And since he was stronger than she was, this is rough. He raped her, and then suddenly Amnon's love turned to hate, and he hated her even more than he loved her, and he said, get out of here, and he snarled at her. Brutal, but very, very real. And here's the thing is, I understand why the world has not acknowledged this. I don't understand why the church has been so far behind. Our Bible acknowledges sexual assault. I don't know why the church has had a, such a hard time being real about it. And so here's the sad thing. The church should have been the leader in speaking out against this. And the truth is we're further behind than Hollywood. And that's a problem. We're further behind than corporate America is. And we need to speak out against it just like the Bible has always spoken out against it because God is against it. So this is Tamar's story, but I want you to hear just just a brief 
portion of both Christina and Tammy's story because I want you to know that this just wasn't a problem then. This is a huge problem now. And just to statistically put this in perspective, one in four girls are sexually molested and one in six boys. That's a problem. It's a huge problem today, and God wants to speak to it. So um, I don't know who wants to go first, but I, I just want to hear just a part of your story so we can just begin to understand what you've had to overcome so that many of us can experience the healing that you guys have experienced. Um, well, my abuse started when I was four years old and lasted about two years. My abuser was a very, very close family friend, which is very typical for sexual abuse um, to happen. It's usually a friend of the family or a close family member that's had access um, to the child. Um, I actually didn't, uh, the abuse stopped simply because of location. We had moved away from where we lived at the time um, and I'd forgotten about it. When you're that age, you don't really have words to say I've been sexually abused. You just know something's different and that's how I felt. I felt like it, it really shifted me um, from uh, being very childlike to now I was in this other realm, if you will. Um, I was never told don't tell, but it was clearly understood. I do remember that. Um, I remember knowing it wasn't okay, but I didn't understand why. I didn't understand words for it. I didn't understand what to do with it. Um, and as time went on, I'd actually, I, I guess, tucked it away and not thought of it. When I was in middle school, it came flooding back to me what had happened and um, went to my family about it. And because it was such a close family friend, nobody really knew what to do with it because it wouldn't just wreck our family, it would wreck their family and a friendship. And, um, and so I, I really resonate with the story of Tamar because it, it, it it messes with the family as it did with ours. And so a lot of my um, wounding actually came after the fact in the way that it was handled more so than the abuse itself. My abuse started when I was uh, seven years old by a man who lived across the street from us. And as I, I think in hindsight how much he actually really lured uh, me in, um, it was a day where he'd asked a bunch of the parents in the neighborhood if their kids could come over and help him in the backyard, lay some stones, plant some flowers. And at the very end when we were done, I remember being the last girl to walk out of the backyard gate. And he closed the gate and began to kiss me and then took me into his garage and molested me. And I remember that being the first time I ever felt like fear, the first memory I have of fear uh, being really alone. Uh, I was frozen. I couldn't talk. Just, uh, it was, it was just an outer body experience. It's just so crazy. Um, and then after that, that began a long journey for me from about the age of seven to 16 of being then abused by a babysitter, my best friend's father, a family member, a family friend. It just, and they were all people that I knew. They were all people in positions of authority in some way in my life. So for me, my story, um, that was kind of the abuse, I think, that, you know, was done to me. And then that translated into things I did, abuse really to myself, um, just promiscuity and obviously being sexualized so early in life uh, just led me down a really bad path. Body image, struggled with an eating disorder. Um, I remember in the ninth grade, just everything kind of hit the fan. And that being the year, I just wanted to end it all. And so I had a suicide attempt in the ninth grade. And really didn't think about my abuse anymore until uh, my early 20s, where I kind of picked it back up and started working on healing. Uh, T Tamar says, where could I go in my shame? Um, can... Each of you speak to how shame has manifested itself in your life. What, what is that, does that look like uh, in your life? 
Yeah, shame is, oh man, it's a dark place. For me, if I had to put a word picture to it, it's just this dark cloud that is in your soul. Like, it's just in there. And I remember just feeling like it was something that I could kind of control, but it really began to overtake me. And shame moved from a feeling of like, I feel ugly, I feel dirty, I feel guilty, I feel unloved, to actually an identity. It was no longer a feeling. It was, I am ugly, I am worthless, I am unlovable, I am damaged. And so shame really shaped how I saw myself, um, what I, I believed about myself. Um, and because I felt so gross on the inside, I think I overcompensated on the outside. Um, I self-protected, really kind of had this mantra of, I've got this. I don't need you. Nobody's safe. I'm going to control everything. You know, when you've been out of control, you don't want to be out of control again. So I'm just going to control what I can. And it was just overwhelmingly damaging to my relationship with myself, God, and, and others. It, there was nowhere I felt I could run from my shame. Yeah, that's so good. I, I think exactly like Christina shared for me, shame came um, in that I knew I was different now. I think as an adult, I can look back and at the time, I think I'm the only person in the world who's experienced such a thing. Um, but it changes you from the inside out. And what I know is that I was a different person on the inside than on the outside. Um, on the inside, I knew I had this thing that I knew about, um, shame for me really played out in what I would say was embarrassment. I had this thing that I was so embarrassed about on the inside, and so what I did is I made sure that I didn't put myself in any position to the, as much as I could control for any embarrassment on the outside. So I didn't go out for sports or try new things or put myself out there because in case I wasn't good at it, then I might be embarrassment and I was already managing all of the embarrassment that I absolutely could. So for me, and that's actually something I still carry with me today, as you know, because we work on all the time. It's okay to not be perfect at something. It's okay, like let it go, laugh at yourself because I couldn't because I just, I was managing all the embarrassment I could possibly have which was my shame. Um, especially if you're a parent, I want you to make a note here, but even if you're not a parent, you need to listen to this. What destroys people's lives is not the event. It's the meaning we attach to the event. It's why you can have two kids who experience sexual abuse and one will thrive and the other's life will fall apart. Meaning is important. And so here's how we've really got to deal with shame. The victim should never feel shame. That's what the perpetrator should feel. That's where it should go. Something shameful did happen, but it's not the victim's fault. And I can't help tell you how many times uh, Tammy and I have talked, and I literally have to remind her, I need you to go back to the age you were. The adult is responsible. And we've had to go to that. Because a lot of times we judge our, our past based upon the maturity that we have. Well, I mean, it doesn't work that way. So watch the meaning that you attach because it can destroy your life. For example, some of you got, got molested, and that's the event, and it's terrible and awful. And the meaning you attached is God's not real, or if he is, he doesn't care. God is real, and he does care. It's, it's a false meaning to the event, and we have to be very, very careful. And so that's our job as a church is to come, come around and attach healthy meaning to the event. No, this is not on you. This is not your fault. This is that person. It's what they did was shameful. It's not you. And so we need healthy community to help us do that, which is why the next point, I want you to write this down. God wants us as Sandals Church to create a safe place for healing. Now, unless this is your first week at Sandals Church, uh, you, 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 you know we're not perfect. Amen. Yeah, amen. Some of you got flipped off in the parking lot. You know that, right? Yeah, that wasn't your number one. That was not that finger. It happens. We, we have imperfect people that attend our church. We mess up. We make mistakes. It happens. Sandals is a church that's a church for everybody. 
That's just who we want to be. We want to welcome everybody. That means we have broken, angry people, and sometimes they flip you off on the way into church. It happens. One time it was a police officer. That was awesome to explain that to the officer. But listen, we do want to be a safe place for healing. We want to be safe. And I have to tell you how important this is. You know, um, I, I, I married a person who was sexually abused. Think about that. From the age of four to six. Right? She should have been watching Sesame Street, and this is her life. Think about Christina. These are, these are two women that I love and care about in my life. I need to be safe for them. Christine and I have been in small group together. Christine and I have also had uh, another woman in our small group whose sexual abuser was her dad. So think about that. The one guy in your life that's supposed to protect you, love you, provide for you, care for you, is the one that victimizes you. And I'll never forget when um, this other woman came to our small group. She brought her son. And Christina, you and I have talked about this as well as Tammy. She would introduce her son to me this way. This is Pastor Matt, and he is safe. He is safe. It's so important that as men, especially as men, that we are safe. That women can trust us. That we are their protectors. Men are not always the abusers, but we usually are. We must learn to become safe. So how to create a safe place for healing. The example I'm going to give is not safe. This is descriptive, not prescriptive. And just so you know, many of you were abused and, and you told your family and they didn't handle it well. Well, guess what? That's how it's handled in the Bible. Not well. So her brother Absalom, who by the way is her oldest brother, he's first in line to the throne. He's the prince. He asked her, is it true that Amnon has been with you? Well, my sister, listen to what he says. Keep quiet. Is that good advice? No. Keep quiet for now. Why? Because he's your brother. We don't want the word to get out that we got a funky family. And that's what happens. A lot of times when abuse occurs in a family, the family circles the wagons and they don't protect the victim. Listen to this next piece. Don't worry about it. Let me translate that. Get over it. Move on. That is not helpful. Now, before we're too harsh on Absalom, I think he means well. He's not trying to be insensitive. He's actually trying to be protective. And, and some of your families are doing the best they can. They just don't know what the best is. And that's part of the healing that needs to take place. Families don't know what to do with this or how to handle this, especially when it's someone who's loved and revered in the family that's being accused. But look what happened to Tamar. So Tamar lived as a desolate woman in her brother Absalom's house. Does that sound good? No. That's not a safe place. That's not a safe environment. And just so you know, if you read the story, it gets worse. For two years, Absalom plots and plans how to get even with his brother. And do you know why? Listen to me if you're a father. David was a man after God's own heart. It's what the Bible says. He was a lousy dad. And I don't mean to disparage David, but it's the truth. Because David did not lead his family well, his son Absalom took justice into his own hands. You know what he did? He killed his brother Amnon. Murdered him. And this caused a division in the house that was so great, ultimately, guess what it did? It divides the kingdom. The entire kingdom chooses sides, Absalom or David. Sweeping this under the rug, taking vengeance into your own hands, none of these things help it. What we need to do is we need to create a safe place. Now, certainly Ab Ab Amnon should have been dealt with, but it should have been by the authorities. It should have been by David. So let's talk about creating a safe place for healing. And the first thing I want to challenge you to do is to listen. You've got to be a better listener. Look at what Proverbs says. Proverbs says, the wise listen to others. Do you know what Proverbs says about foolish people? They're always doing this. 
And so just know this. Victims are terrified to tell. They're scared to death to tell. Think about how tragic that is. A crime is committed against you and you're afraid to tell. So we all need to be good listeners. So I'm going to ask my wife to speak to this and she's going to be very gentle because I've not always been the best listener. And those are laugh, this laughter of love, but she's going to share. <laughs> yes, you have. Yes, okay. Um, yeah, I can really identify with Tamar's story because mine was very similar of let's just keep quiet about this. We don't want anyone to feel uncomfortable, which made me feel absolutely uncomfortable. And to me, it translated like this doesn't matter or you don't matter enough for other people to feel uncomfortable. Um, and so as I've been on the journey to healing, one of the things that I'm most passionate about is actually helping other people become safe places to be real. I often refer to that as being a good heart handler because for someone who's experienced abuse, one of um, the way shame plays out is if I tell somebody they're going to be disgusted by me, they're going to leave, they won't all be rejected. And so that's really where the enemy keeps that shame alive and well in people. However, um, the way that that is dispelled and that God does a real healing work is when it's received well. And there's actually statistics and studies that prove that the way that someone's confession um, is received actually has such great power into the detriment of their future. If it's not received well, they tend to have a lot of emotional, psychological, relational issues as an adult. Or if it is received well, then they tend to be much more emotionally healthy. And so uh, the listening part, the being a receiver of real, because it's not just important for us to be real, it's a, it's important for us to be good receivers of real. And here's what that looks like um, for, as, as pertains to listening is when somebody's sharing with you about an abuse that they've had um, to actually listen, that's not your time to go, I totally understand and let me tell you I've been through something similar and now it's about you. Um, it, it doesn't look like... Well, God gives us more than, you know, never gives us more than we can heal. Because the person may be questioning and wrestling with, why did God let this happen to me? When somebody is sharing something with me that I know um, is dark for them, the first thing I try to do is bring light to them by acknowledging the bravery and courage that it took for them to get that out. Because the power happens in they got it out and I'm still sitting here. I might say something like, thank you for trusting me with that. I know that was so hard. Acknowledging the humanity and hurt, like, I'm so sorry that happened to you. Because in this moment, it's about them. I'm here for you. I love you. I believe you. And then also to um, ask good questions. Not questions like, tell me more about that. What was it like? Where did, like, the details are not the point. That person, it may have been everything they have to get it out there. And that's all they have. Um, here's what listening doesn't look like. It doesn't look like making it about you. Um, especially, I want to say this to parents out there, that's, that's so hard to hear that something happened to your child. But when you become this breakdown of emotion, now the victim ends up being the caretaker to how you feel instead of how they feel, which can be very damaging. There's a time and a place to deal with that, but it might not be there. Um, it's not a time for judgment. Did it happen? Did it not happen? We're not the detective when we're being a receiver of real. We're being a safe place to be real. Um, and then... Just to really, um, in those questions, ask things like, how can I help you? Is there anything else uh, you need to tell me? What do you want your next steps to be like? And let them really um, be able to go on that journey with you in that way. I, I think it's just so important. And in that way, you will be such a huge part of someone's healing journey. Amen. So first thing we want to do is we listen. The next thing we do is we report. Please circle this. 
You are all mandated to report. Every single one of you. Listen, you're not the judge, you're not the jury, and you certainly are not the detective. Your job is to report. I've had people tell me this, Pastor, I want to tell you something, but I need you to promise me you won't tell anyone. Do you know what I say to that? I love you. I care about you, but I cannot make that promise. I cannot do that. Because if you tell me something that I am morally bound to tell, I must tell it. So you, you need to tell people that. When they say, I want to share something with you, and there's no way you can tell anyone, you say, if there's any way possible I can keep this a secret, I will. But there are some things that you cannot keep a secret, and here's why. Look at the next verse. We're going to talk more about this passage next week. But it says, love does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Sin's power is in secrecy. God's power is in the light. If you want to heal, let me challenge you, you need to reveal. And here's why. Statistically, we know that if a person abuses one child, most abusers abuse between one and nine kids. What that means is it's not going to stop. And we may not be able to prevent what happened to you, but we can prevent what happens to someone else. We need to report this. We need to do this because it's important. We, love rejoices when the truth wins out. And there are hard things that we have to talk about. Tammy and I have had to talk through hard things, difficult things, things that she didn't want to share. But we had to talk about them because love rejoices when the truth wins out. And we need to do that. So we create a safe place by listening and by reporting. And, and Christina... I think that you have something special to say, especially about this issue, about how important it is to report. Absolutely. For me, when I finally told my parents about my, my first two abuses, uh, they protected me from the abusers. But f for whatever reason they were doing, I know the best that they could at that time, but I know that they didn't tell the police. And I've always wondered how many other kids how many other um, boys or girls were affected and abused at the hands because they didn't turn him in. And uh, so it's just, we have the opportunity to help save lives, you know, to help be a voice of protection for others. And so as hard as it is, as scary as it is, um, if you can report, it's just essential. But I also know for a lot of us, our stories, sometimes we remember things years later or we don't know where um, the abusers are. And the other part of reporting is us reporting our story, us telling our story. For me, that was the beginning of my healing. When I started to disengage from the shame, when I started to come out of hiding and really started um, just talking about what happened and figuring out what was the next step and the next step, I cannot tell you the empowerment that comes when you tell your story. And that might seem absolutely terrifying, but there's something that happens. I mean, it's, it's true. When we bring things into the light, um, especially within the church, we have the power of Jesus Christ. We have the love of other people to come and surround us. And so I just, I, I just really, really, really want to encourage um, you in here. If you've never told someone, please let this be a day. Let this be a moment that you don't let pass by and know that there is victory. As much as we're talking about this and it's so hard to have our faces and our names attached to this, but we're here because there's hope on the other side. There's healing on the other side. And it starts with owning your story or it will own you. So tell your story. Amen. Next, what do we do as a church? So we listen, we report, and then we support. Then we come alongside, and we're there for the person, and we minister to them, and we care for them. You know, Christina and I have been in small group, I think, for three years together. Tammy and I have been married for 22 years. And I, I can't tell you how many times I, I, I've told Christina, I want to I wanna be safe. I want you to feel safe. Because she's been disappointed and assaulted by so many men. So I want to be that safe guy for you in your life. I want, you, I want to be the brother that you need. I, I want to be a loving, protecting brother. 
uh, for Tammy, I, I want to be a loving, protecting man. I'm your husband. But they also need a community, people to come around, people to come alongside. Listen to what the Bible says, brothers and sisters. And by the way, this is how we're to treat each other as brothers and sisters are supposed to. Not maybe the way brothers and sisters treated you and your family because you fought all the time, but we're supposed to be loving and kind and protective of each other. It says, circle these words, encourage those who are timid. People are scared to death to tell their story. After our previous service, I was out in the lobby and an 80-year-old woman came up to me and she said, thank you so much for dealing with this. It happened to me and I told my parents and they didn't believe me. She said, I'm glad I came to church today. This sermon allowed her to speak on something for the first time. She said, thank you. Encourage those who are timid. Take care of those who are weak. Wounded people are weak. We're a hospital. Right? We're a hospital. Would you walk through Kaiser going, get over it, suck it up. <laughs> That's what we do in the church. Here's a Bible verse. Can you imagine? Be, t be safe, be caring, be loving. Underline this next verse, be patient with everyone. Not everybody's going to heal in the same time frame. They're not. And let me say this, the more the abuse, the longer the healing. And so we need to be there for them. Now, some of you are freaked out. You're like, okay, that's why I'm never joining a small group because I don't know what to say. I'm terrified. Let me just say this. None of us know what to say. But I know who does. His name is Jesus. Write this down. Bring them to Jesus. What does God want to do for abused people. He wants us to bring them to Jesus. When you read through your Bible, every time somebody doesn't know what to do, my kid's dead, what do I do? Bring them to Jesus. I've been hemorrhaging for 12 years, what do I do? Go to Jesus. I have a paralyzed friend who can't walk, what do we do? Take him to Jesus. When people are at the end of their rope, they go to Jesus, and that's what we need to learn to do. And let me say this, counseling is great. It's great, I would encourage you to go to counseling. I would encourage you to, to seek help but you don't just need healing, you actually need the healer. That's who Jesus is. That's the role of the church. The church can introduce people to the healer. I love this verse. It's one of my favorite verses. Matthew uh, eleven twenty eight 28 and 29. Jesus said, come to me. All of you who are weary and heavy, heavy burdens. That's what abuse is. It's a heavy burden that many of you have been carrying by yourself. Jesus says, you don't have to carry that alone. I will carry it with you. I will come alongside. Jesus is the most amazing human being that ever walked the face of the earth because he's not just a human being. He's God in human flesh. He says, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and let me teach you, Jesus says, because I am humble, circle this word, and gentle. Gentle. The most powerful being in the universe is gentle. And you will find rest for your souls. That's my prayer for you. I guess my question to both of you is, is how has Jesus been instrumental um, in your healing? Um, for me, Jesus has really been my, my uh, detangler, I would say. My abuse and me were so enmeshed like this. Um, I couldn't tell where it ended and I began. And, and at, at Jesus began to detangle that for me of here's what he says about me and here's what he says about abuse. And so that has been so freeing for me in the way that he... Um, has just been able to help me figure out what is the truth. Because when you've experienced abuse, um, everything's kind of gray. Like, was it? What, you know, what really happened? Who really believed? What do we do with it? Um, and so for me, I'm, I'm a very, one of the ways it's really affected me is I'm really black and white. I'm really, I don't do well in the gray, and, and Jesus isn't gray. He is, he, he speaks it how it is. He speaks 
what's right, what's wrong, what's truth, what's not. And so for me, he's been the replacer of lies with the truth and my detangler. Yeah, I agree with everything that you said. And Jesus, for me, has really been everything in my healing. I mean, counseling was essential and um, community has been essential. But abuse attacks the soul, like the core of who you are. And there's only one person who can get there who can repair in that place. And this is the thing that I realized, it took a lot of time, but the shame and the lies and the things I believed about myself, I, I needed my maker, my creator, to reshape my identity. And so the thing that abuse does, and, and the enemy gets in there, he really tries to steal our God-intended purposes early, whether this happened as if you were a child or any point in your life, the enemy wants to get in there and just puts you on a different trajectory. And Jesus is the one who put me back on my path and said, I have a plan for you. There's a hope for you. You are not your abuse. There is hope. There is a story beyond this. And um, Jesus conquered sin, death, and the grave. And so I, I knew that with Christ, he would get me through that. And so I just want to speak that over this entire place. And, and those watching, um, please run to Jesus. Amen. And I think this is... This is really important for you to know about God, especially if, if you've been abused. Jesus has come to me. He never forces himself on you. Ever. Isn't that amazing how awesome our God is? God does not force you to love him. He does not force you to choose him. He invites you. And here's why you need Jesus. Listen, some of you have gone through pain that will never be fully healed in this life. Here's the good news about Jesus and why you need him. Because he doesn't just work in this life, he works in eternal life. And there are some things that Jesus is going to fully heal in the next life. In the second to the last chapter, in the last book in your Bibles, Jesus is said to do this, that he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, all suffering, and there will be no more death, no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain. Underline this. All these things are gone forever. They're gone. That's why you want to be there. And the one sitting on the throne, you know who his name is? Jesus. He said, look, I am making everything, circle this word, new. New. The heartache of what my friends have experienced is at the age of four and six, someone made a decision for them that can't be unmade. Here's the beauty. In heaven, it can. Think about this. In heaven, every terrible thing that you've ever been through will simply have been a bad dream. Because you are new. New. And let me say this if you've been abused. Jesus makes this promise. Nothing evil will be allowed in heaven. Nothing evil. Which brings us to our last point. God wants us to warn the guilty and protect the innocent. Listen to me. If you are a sexual predator, listen to me. This week I watched a father in tears in a court in the United States of America, lunge at the molester of his daughters, a doctor whom he trusted. He lunged at them, and listen to me, he was stopped by police officers, and if you listen very carefully to the video, you can hear the police officers trying to calm him down, saying, we understand, we understand. And the father is writhing, and here's why, because no matter how long they lock that predator up, there is no justice on this earth. But I want you to know, if you've been abused, you have a father in heaven and he is a lion. And when he pounces, there is no one that can hold him back. No one. And Jesus Christ's harshest words are this. If you were ever going to cause or lead a little child into sin, Jesus says this, you would better be better off if you drowned yourself. That's Jesus. 
2,000 years ago, Jesus spoke to people who abuse children. He said, you're better off if you drown yourself. We warn the guilty. And here's what I'm warning you. If there's any chance at all that the gospel is real in your life, and I believe the gospel is for everyone, if there's any hope for you at all, and you want mercy in heaven, I challenge you to throw yourself at the mercy of the court. Repentance means you get real with the authorities about what you've done. That's what repentance means. The gospel is real if you get real. But if you want mercy from God, you must throw yourself at the mercy of the courts. Listen to me, church. Our job is to protect the innocent. Our job is to come around those and to protect those and to make Sandals Church safe. Safe. That's our job. To be safe. And I want to challenge especially the men in this church. Be safe. Be safe. And the women in our church, be safe. Because we have little ones that are looking to us to protect them. And we have a God who's commanded us to protect them. In every uh, sermon in this series, and they all won't be this difficult, I promise. Come back. In every service, we're going to end during this series with a blessing. And I want to end by praying a prayer of blessing over everyone who's either been abused or if you know someone or your family has been affected by sexual abuse. And I'm going to pray this blessing. It's actually found in Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 through 26. And let me tell you something. The world may count you as a statistic, but to God, you are never a number. And he prays this prayer over you in the book of Numbers. And do you know why? Because people count to God. They matter. So if you just bow your head and lift up your hand as I pray this prayer of blessing over everyone who's been affected or knows someone who's been affected. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and may the Lord give you his peace. Heavenly Father, we close this service by praying in the powerful and mighty name of Jesus. Lord, our world is wicked, but you are good. Many people even people who've come in your name have been unsafe, but you are safe. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you would anoint this church with your protection, that this would be a safe place, that this would be a healing place, that this would be a place where people can put their lives back together. God, I pray right now through the powerful and mighty name of Jesus that you would speak to every victim of sexual abuse and that they would know that this is a horrible chapter in their story, but it is not the end of their story. God, you can rewrite their life if they trust you, if they turn to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. We love you, Jesus, and we know that your heart breaks for those who've been broken. Amen. I love you, Sandals Church. Thank you so much. God bless.